No, it's for that person who wants to fall asleep today. <laughs> we will cure that. Remember, I used to pitch. I can flat knock you out, okay? So don't you fall asleep on me. Good morning, everybody. I want to not only say good morning to all of you, but also those that have joined us online. There are, as David said, people who log in literally around the world. And um, some of them are people who just can't physically get up and go to church. Some of them have been wounded. Some of them are seeking. And I want them to feel as part, much a part of the family here as each of us are. It's important. The Bible says it's not good to be alone. And for those of you that are joining us online, we, we do welcome you. We're glad you're here. And uh, feel free uh, on the comments. If you have a prayer request, something this church body can be praying f- with you about, feel free to share that in the, in the live comments. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse eight. And God is able. Well, what a great way to start a verse. Everybody say God is able to make all grace. Everybody say all grace. Abound toward you that you always, say the word always, Always. having all sufficiency, say all sufficiency, sufficiency. in all things, say all things, may have an abundance for every, say every, Every. good work. Could God have made that any more clear? All grace, all sufficiency, all things, every good work. Would you pray with me and for me this morning? Father, I know what you put in my heart. And I I sense an urgency about today, Father, and I I don't know why, but I, I believe it to be from you. So Holy Spirit, you know the deal. I'm nothing, you're everything. Would you speak to every heart in here? Would you make the path straight? Would you reveal truth to each of us on an individual basis? Father, I by faith claim the ability to hear distinctly. I pray for freedom and liberty to share your heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God is able. Boy, we could stop right there. That's, that's the whole thing right there. God is able. He's able. It doesn't matter what you face. God's able. I have a sense in my spirit we are facing days that for those who are sincerely plugged into God, you're going to see in measure like never before how able God is. God is able. Regardless of what you face, regardless the size of the need, regardless of the situation, God is able. He always has been able. He has never once fallen short. He has always been 100% able. He is able right now. He will be able tomorrow. God is able. 
Somebody needs to get that down into your spirit for a moment. You're facing a difficulty. And the enemy has convinced you that God is not able. I want to tell you, God is able. He is absolutely able. Don't, 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 don't bring up the circumstances. God is able. If the army of Egypt is behind you and you have nowhere to go, God is able. When there's no food in the desert, God is able. When the giant is that tall and you're a boy with a stick and stones, God is able. If you're a donkey, God is able. If the axe head is in the water and has sunk to the bottom, God is able. I, I say that because sometimes people think that, that he's able, but in a spiritual sense. You know, like, but he's able. It, if his ability doesn't manifest also in the physical, then he's really not able. He's able. He's 100% able. He has been trying for years to get me to, to, to understand that in the deepest level. And I've told you the silly story back in the day when if you didn't have a church bulletin, you weren't really anointed. You know, there was a time when you went into church and you had to have a church bulletin. Without a church bulletin, you're not a church and people would have a fit on you. They show up for church and you don't have a church bulletin. And it's Saturday night and I don't have a church bulletin. And this nasty old Xerox machine I had, I can't get it to work, and nothing's working. It, it's 11 o'clock at night, and I just want to go home and go to bed. I, I got to preach in the morning, but I don't have a bulletin. Forget a word from God. Forget worship. You don't even know how to pray if you got a bulletin. And I had a bulletin. I just couldn't copy it. And in that moment, I said, God, what am I going to do? I've already opened the thing and fooled with it a half a dozen times, using all my wisdom about copying machines, which is zero. You ever looked in the side of one of those things? And all of a sudden, I just, it just hit me. I'm not saying God told me. All of a sudden, I just saw in my mind's eye, opening the front of the copier, sticking my hand in and going like this. And I thought, you, you know what? I'll never have to tell anybody about this. <laughs> Nobody will ever know I did this. Though, why not? I pulled down it and I stuck my hand in there and I did this and I banged around and it kind of hurt a little bit because there were some sharp edges. I took my hand out and I laughed. <laughs> and I shut it and, and I, I started to walk away. And, and inwardly I said, well, <laughs> that was good for a laugh. Gosh, that was silly. And then something inside of me said, you didn't try. So I, I took the original and stuck it back down in there and turned the machine on. Ten copies and... They look, I'm telling you, as God is my witness, they looked better than they had ever looked the entire time I had been pastor there. They looked so good that, that, that our secretary who came in on Mondays to go through the books and do things, and she said she ran to run off some copies. She called me in my house, and she said, what did you do to the copier? This thing's working great, and I didn't have the courage to tell her, well, I did this. And, and you, you see, I think God was trying to show me something that, you know, even if it's a copier that doesn't work, he's able. If it's an axe head that's sunk at the bottom of a ri river, he's able. 
And when the Berlin Wall used to be up, there was a Christian missionary, we heard this from him firsthand, who transported Bibles into eastern Germany. And he, he had a Volkswagen bug, and he used to hide them in the seats and hide them everywhere, but there was a limited, you know, he could only do about 10 or 12. And one day he felt like the Spirit of God told him to load up the entire trunk with all these boxes that says Bibles on it. And if you know the Volkswagen Beetle, the, it's, the trunk is in the front. And he, he said, God, what are, you, what are you saying? And God said to him, I not only can make blinded eyes see, I can make seeing eyes blind. He said, you know, I'm, I'm in trouble if they catch me. But he knew the Spirit of God, and so he filled up the front of his Volkswagen with these cases of Bibles. And they drove, he drove to the checkpoint, and the guard says, do you have anything you want to declare? He answered truthfully, no. <laughs> he said, come open the trunk. He got out and he walked around and he opened it and he's looking at seven or eight cases that clearly says Bibles on it. The guy looks at it for a minute, looks Okay, we're good. And so he shuts it. He slowly walks around, gets in, and just drives across the border. God's trying to tell us something this morning. I'm asking you, as your pastor, I have a sense that the timing of this is him. He wants you to know that he's able. He, he doesn't need help from a government to be able. He doesn't need situations in our country or our world to change for him to be able. He is able. That's the end of the story. He is able. He just said this into my spirit. Quit telling him he's not. He's able. Whatever you're facing, he's able. Gail Beth and I have seen him put gas in our car, food on our table, favor from strangers. He's moved on our behalf. When I was, we were up against a wall and I, I, I was, we were broken and I, I, I went to God in prayer and I said, God, I, I, I need $2,500. We haven't had a vacation so long. We were broken and burnt out. I didn't even have a running car. I said, God, I need $2,500, and I need something to drive. I need a vehicle. That's real practical, folks. I'm not going to go through the whole story again. That prayer happened on Tuesday. On Saturday, the check was in the mail from somebody. I didn't tell another person on this planet about the need. And the check didn't come from the church body. It came from somebody hundreds and hundreds of miles away. God spoke to them to send me the check. Sunday morning, church people, family came up to me and said, Pastor, I just want to let you know we're not going to be here Wednesday. We got to go down to Florida. We co-signed a note for our son to buy a brand new pickup truck. We just got a call from the bank yesterday. He hasn't made one payment in four months. And we either got to pay it off or start making the payments, but he's not keeping the truck. So we won't be here Wednesday night for service. We'll be traveling back from Florida. But we do got good news. We, we prayed about what we should do, and God said, give the truck to your pastor. So I prayed on Tuesday, and by Sunday, a $2,500 check to the penny was in the mail, and the church member is about to give me a four-month-old truck with a little over 1,000 miles on it. I want to tell you something. God is able. But he's not just able in financial things. That's the, that's the bottom of it, people. 
Your sights need to be higher than that. The bottom of it is the financial. The enemy makes that the top. The, the bottom is the financial. When God tries to describe heaven to us, he says, well, I'm going to take the best you have to describe the worst we have. You know that gold you guys got? We pave roads with it. Diamonds, rubies, that's like your, our cinder blocks. God is able. I want to encourage you, if you're not coming on Wednesday night, begin coming this Wednesday night. We're going to be talking about how, how the kingdom of God operates. You need to know something. You need, we need a reset here. You need to know something. God owns everything. God is able. He's not getting ready. As the saying goes, he was born ready. God is able. Whatever your situation, God is able. Whatever you face, God is able. God is able to make all grace. You see, he, he doesn't show up. You've got to understand what he's saying here. He's not going to show up with a, a little package. He's going to back up the dump truck. Hear the beeping sound in the spirit? Beep, beep, come on back. He's, going to, he's not going to give you just what you need and only specific things. All grace is available. Everything, the whole storehouse, everything on every shelf, he's able. Listen, I, I don't want to belabor that point. It just, it's in my spirit. You got to quit telling God he can't. You can't buy the lie that your problem is because God is not able. He's able. He is able. It doesn't matter whether they've been dead for a few moments or dead for an hour or dead for a couple of days or dead in the casket on the way to the graveyard or dead so that every witness there said, surely he's rotting and stinking. None of that matters. He's able. He's able. He's able to change it just like that. He's able to fix it just like that. Somebody's saying here right now, we've got, I'm complicated. It's not that simple with me. It's more difficult. Listen, <laughs> the moment your difficulty becomes greater than God, your difficulty is your God. I need to write that down. That just came to me. Listen, he's able, able. I, I, I grew up and I, I've long forgiven him and I'm looking forward to the day that I get into heaven and I see him, but my, my dad had a contrary relationship with nearly the whole planet, so it wasn't just personal. And I got word that he was dying and I asked another minister to go visit and he wouldn't he would go visit, he'd do the pat on the back thing and hope you're okay sort of thing, but he wouldn't challenge my dad for salvation. I was mad at him. I said, forget it, don't go. I, that, that had to happen. Because I could imagine up until this point in my life that God could save just about everybody, but, but not my dad. Can you relate to that? Not, not my dad. He's too hard. He's too old. He's too set in his ways. You think I'm stubborn? He was more. I had to be there. I had to walk in the room and see this, this man. Though, though he was dazed from death, he was still fully cognizant. He conversed. He talked. He had his mind about him. And it filled the Spirit of God move on me. And this man that I, was, I spent my whole life to this point in his shadow, terrified of him, I had to stop and say, Dad, I need you to be quiet. I've got to talk to you about something. I've got to talk to you about what he's done in me. 
And I took 15 minutes or so and just shared the best that I knew how. And then I, I thought it's time to ask him to pray. And I, I never in my wildest imagination expected anything other than him to say, leave me alone. I said, Dad, would you like to ask God to forgive you of your sins? He said, yeah, help me. And I, I prayed with him. And a change came over him. It was like somebody else entered his body in that moment. I don't know how to explain to you. In that moment, God was able now for me to know he can save anybody. I know this guy. If God can save him, God can save anybody. Hour and a half later, I left to drive home, and I get home, and I'm only home a little while. My mom calls me on the phone. She said, I, I just got back from the hospital. She's mad. She sounds mad. I said, okay. What did you do to your father? <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean? And she starts crying. She said, I just spent the last two hours with the man that I had hoped to be married to for the last 51 years. He's able, folks. He's able. Whatever you're up against, whatever you are up against, quit believing the lie that the attack on the enemy on their life is greater than God's ability to make it all gone in a moment. I like what Jesus, when he's arguing with the Pharisees, he says, if Beelzebub casts out Beelzebub, then who does your children cast him out? Then he says, in reality, it's the finger of God <laughs> that casts him out. Finger. Not even the whole fist. Not fingers. Finger of God. <laughs> with the finger of God. It's nothing for God. He's always been able. He has always been able to make all grace abound. Not dribble it out. Abound. That's the kind of God we serve. Abound to you. Why? So that you, me, you, everybody say me, me, always, not sometimes, always, to this day, Heidi Baker's ministry starts cooking feed, food that wouldn't or normally feed a couple of hundred people. And they feed thousands with it and have food left over. Every time. This isn't a one-off story. Every time. He's always able to make all grace abound so that you always have all sufficiency right now you need to speak to your inadequacy You're afraid to take the next step in ministry because you feel your inadequacy. You're afraid to take the next step in your career because you're afraid of your inadequacy. You're afraid to take the next step in 
fill in the blank, because you're afraid of your inadequacy. We talked about it Wednesday night. Focus on what you have, not on what you don't have. God is always simply wanting you to focus on what you have. Moses, what do you got in your hand? Moses is trying to talk God out of using him. Just like some of you are doing. Well, God, I, I don't... I, what do you got? I, 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 got, I got a staff. All right, we'll use that. David, what do you got? I got a slingshot and stones. All right, we'll use that. Come on. What have you got? We got a little boy's lunch. All right, we'll use that. It's his desire. That you have all sufficiency in all things. Man, we almost, if we were a lawyer, we're looking for the escape clause. Back in the day when, we, when, when I used to deal in real estate, before I got saved, before I went to the ministry, my hope was to be, uh, own real estate, and so I bought and sold real estate. My dad taught me how to write a contract to always get out if I find out later I don't want the deal. It was an escape clause, and it's called a contingency, and the contingency was simply this. Subject to buyer receiving adequate financing. So that was always my escape clause. And if they were willing to sign that contract with me, I could get out of any deal. Because I'm the one that determines whether it's adequate or not. Do you see what I'm saying? So I get partway through the deal, and I find out there's liens on the property. I get partway through the deal, and I find out this is busted, and that's expensive. I find out, I just tell them that uh, the, the, the financing available for this project is not adequate, and so I'm backing out. If we're a lawyer, if we're legal, if you're trying to find a way out of this verse, God has written this so that it's airtight. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. End of contract. Always. Who? You. Who's ever reading this? It's like the, a finger is pointing up at the page as you read this. Hey, Stacy. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Carmela, God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, having all sufficiency in all things, he means that. You may have an abundance for every good work. Every work. Can I tell you that last word is the word we need to focus? Because you see, the way that the kingdom of God operates is he only blesses that which is in circulation. He doesn't bless you to save it up. You're not to be a dam in a river. He doesn't bless you financially so that you're blessed financially. He will bless you financially in abundance so you'll start giving it away. Oh, go, go with me to Luke chapter 6. David, you're never going to see the offering again if you keep getting on my verses. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give. What? Give. To who? Give. 
when? Give. How? Give. It doesn't matter. Come on. And it will be given to you. That's an absolute. Listen, if you're, if you're, if you're keeping this only financial, you're not, you're not understanding what he's saying. It's in everything. I have this ball here. Borrowed from Ira. He took my driver's license until I give it back to him. If I drop this ball, what's going to happen? Oh, no, are you guys really? You don't know? Let me, let me show it to you. We'll demonstrate it one time. Okay. Now, if I drop this ball, what will happen? It's going to bounce. I'm going to go over here. <laughs> if I drop this ball, what happens? It's going to bounce back. How do you know that? How do you know that? Why, why does it, why does it, when I let go of it, why does it bounce? Why did it fall? It's a law. It doesn't matter whether this ball is black, white, green, yellow, red. What if, is it bouncing because I'm so good? Like if somebody questionable were to bounce it, like Jeff. Okay? Would it bounce? Okay. Somebody who's really good, like Tracy, if she bounced it, would it bounce? Are you sure? What if I did it over here? Will it bounce? I'm not being silly. This is what the Holy Spirit drove home to me. Will it, will it bounce? It bounces because there's a law called the law of gravity. God said there would be a law of gravity. He designed it that way. There's gravity because it keeps us on this planet. Without the gravity, we'd float out in space. I wish there wasn't quite as much gravity because then I could jump higher. If there was less gravity, I'd weigh like 14 pounds. It'd be like, hey, don't need to die. I'd only weigh 14 pounds. But he put a certain amount of gravity on that makes me heavy. It's his fault. Listen, he is, everything he, listen, everything he does is done decently and in order. He is a God of order. He's the God who said, it doesn't matter if it's noon or midnight. It doesn't matter if it's nice outside or bad outside it doesn't matter if it's jeff or tracy or pastor you drop that ball it's going to bounce it's going to fall to the ground i can stand up here and do this a hundred billion times let go of this ball and it will never do anything different than fall are you with me it falls the bible says that god upholds the world by his word this ball falls because God created a natural law that says stuff falls. I'm sure it's more intricate than that, but basically that's what it boils down to. Stuff falls. You could bring an old man up here, an old woman up here, a young man a young woman, black, white, yellow, red, rich, poor, pretty, handsome, not so pretty, not so handsome, with their eyes closed, looking in the wrong direction. Every time, are you hearing me? Every time you drop the ball, the ball falls, because God created a law.
It's a natural law. We know that because we've experienced that. When I asked, how do you know, somebody up out here said, because we've seen it happen. In Luke 6.38 is a supernatural law made by the same God, the very same God that determined that this ball would fall is the God who said, give, and it will be given to you. The same God. Give, it will be given to you. Give, it will be given to you. Give, and it will be given to you. When the enemy tells you that your need isn't being met because of some shortcoming of God, God would say, I'm able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. That's what he said. Why don't I have it? Give, it will be given unto you. Give, it will be given unto you. You keep thinking money. This is more than money. Money is the bottom rung of the ladder. Give, it will be given unto you. Don't give. You want to know when this wall ball won't bounce back to me? When I don't bounce it. <laughs> And the same God who made this is the same God who says, give. It'll be given unto you. Give. It will be given unto you. Now listen to me for a moment. Gail Beth and I don't have any tomatoes in our garden. None. None. It's, it's sad. Every morning when I have looked out in my backyard, hoping, nothing like a good big tomato. Oh, my gosh. Slice that. Some salt. Oh, my gosh. That's just, I can feel the anointing on that. You know what I'm talking about? Sweet corn. I've looked out. You know how many sweet corn we've harvested so far? None. It's already in the middle of August. We don't have any sweet corn. You know how many tomatoes we have? Zero. You wonder why? We didn't plant any. Now, now wouldn't that be stupid of me to complain about not having tomatoes if you didn't plant any? And if I'm, not, if I'm not careful, I'll say, I don't have any tomatoes because God doesn't love me. Come on now. I'm, this is where the rubber meets the road. I, I, don't, I don't have any tomatoes because God don't love me. I don't have no sweet corn because God doesn't love me. God says, no, you give. And it will be given to you. He says, I want you to know I'm able I want you to know where my heart is at. I'll back the dump truck up. But you release it with this. You see, that's an act of faith. If this ball was worth a, a billion dollars, I'd be afraid of throwing it down and catching it if I didn't know I was going to be able to catch it. God forbid it might roll towards David and he run with it. Yeah. And you all would have a good laugh. Look at those two old guys. <laughs> First one to their walker wins. No. Uh, 
give. Listen, I'm going I'm to break a religious, religious tradition here right now. Somebody says, you, you can't give to get. What? You, you, you know why I would plant tomatoes? Because I wanted tomatoes. You know why I would plant corn? Because I want corn. I don't ha- put together a bed for the garden and, and prepare the land and buy the seed and put tomatoes in, seed in, and then when tomatoes come up, go, oh, I didn't want tomatoes. No, I did that to plant tomatoes because I wanted tomatoes. Listen to me for in the spirit here right now. Jesus didn't put any qualifiers on this. He's give. Just give. He nails it. Let's look at one more verse. Galatians 6, 7. I'm reading in New King James. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Stop for a second. Just stop. You know, I've heard so many preachers use this as a a word curse on people. This isn't a word curse on people. This is God speaking to his people, letting you and I know. He's underscoring what he said in 2 Corinthians we read earlier. He's literally telling your adversary and telling us, don't let him fool you. Don't buy that, that I'm not able. Don't believe that I won't move. Don't believe that I can't. Don't believe it won't work for you. Don't be deceived. I refuse to be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what he will reap. Them's fighting words. That's not only a word to us, it's a word to our enemy. Because he's the one that said, give, and it shall be given unto you. And he knows that we will be living in a land where our adversary will try to use logic. The Red Sea doesn't normally part like that, people. Manna doesn't normally fall from heaven. Axe heads don't normally float. Boys do not normally take down giants. You don't normally walk around a city for a few days and have the walls crumble, crumble, crumble down. Okay? People don't normally come back from the dead. People that are born blind, been blind their whole life, don't automatically pop open their eyes and see. Demons just don't automatically leave. There's a, there's a process here. And God's wanting you to understand. He said, I have put my word on it. I will not let any demon mock me. So don't be deceived. Don't let him teach you anything other than this. I will not let him mock me. As a man sows, you have my word on it he will receive. Give, and it will be given to you. Now, we're going to close the service as soon as I can drop this ball and it stays in the air. Because we would have to stay here that long to find out when God is not able. Because they're one and the same. They're one and the same. The same God who said, ball, fall, says, give. If you need a friend, be a friend. If you need kindness, give kindness. 
Don't, don't give out of your abundance. When I, when I feel better about myself, I'll help, help other people feel better about themselves. No, 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 no. When you feel like trash, find somebody else who feels like trash. Come on. When you need a word of life spoke to you, don't just stand there and say, God, speak a word of life to me. Go out and plant some tomatoes. Give, and it shall be given to you. When you, when you. when you really don't know the direction in your life, pray and ask God to put somebody in your heart. Send them a text letting them know you're praying for them. God may give you a word for them. Why? Because you want tomatoes, you plant tomatoes. You want corn, you plant corn. You need encouragement, then give encouragement. Because God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what he will reap. Give. And it will be given unto you. God says, I'll make sure. I'll close with this. We didn't have but... $700 to buy a car. That's it. God had pointed me to this car a month and a half ago, and I didn't want the car, Justin. It was a 72 Chrysler New Yorker. If you know Chrysler New Yorkers, it will barely fit in here. The back seat has its own zip code. You have a telephone between the front seat and the back seat, not because you're cool, because it's that far away. When we put our little son Gabriel in that back seat, it's like he got lost. We had to put binoculars on to see if he was okay back there. I didn't want to drive around a Chrysler New Yorker. But I'm out of time. We had borrowed somebody's car, and it's Saturday afternoon, and they're coming to church Sunday morning, and they're going to get their car from us. We went and looked at one other car for, we could afford for $700, and it was garbage. I mean, let's, it's $700, people. And I keep thinking about that one Chrysler New Yorker. But I've got an out because I don't remember the phone number and I threw the newspaper away that has it listed and don't you dare show that picture to anybody. (laughs) Listen to me, this is before the days of cell phone. And so I said to God, I'm sorry, I I should have gone where I felt like you directed me, but I blew it, I'm sorry. And I've thrown the paper away. And as I'm praying that, a telephone number comes in my head. So we pull over and find a pay phone. I dial 614. I dial the phone number in my head. Some guy answers. I said, sir, do you, do you have a Chrysler New Yorker for sale? He said, yes. I said, is it still available? He said, yes. I said, is there any chance we could come see the car yet today? It's like 4.30 in the afternoon on a Saturday. He goes, well, it's not here at the house. He said, it's at the Columbus Auto Auction. I can meet you there. He said, do you know where that's at? I literally go, um, no, no. There's a sign. We're 100 yards away from the Columbus Auto Auction. I said, yeah, we can meet you. So we met him, he got over there 20 or 30 minutes later, we got out, looked at the car, I still didn't want it, but it was in incredible condition. It was his grandmother's car, you know, the old lady driven car. And it was in beautiful shape. And he said, the reason it's here is I ran it through the auction and I had a minimum bid of $3,000 on it. And it only got up to 2800 And he says, there ain't no way I'm going to take $2,800 on this car. He says, you like it? You going to make an offer? Give me a second. One well, of the dumbest things I've ever done in my life. I went back to the car and I told Gail Beth, I said, how much do you got with you? 
and we dug around. We literally were pulling chain, chains out. We came up with another $34. So I went back out there and I said, I want to make you an offer. I'll give you $734 for it. At first, it's like I slapped him. He goes, I just turned down $2,800 earlier today. And he just kept looking at me, Ira. And literally, we've heard this term more than once now in our life. He looked at me and said, I don't even know why I'm doing this. But I'll take it. I gave him $734 for the car. Drove it for years until it developed an engine problem and sold it for $3,000. I can't tell you the number of times Gail Beth and I have to fight back the laugh. I don't know why I'm doing this. But yes, I don't know why I'm doing this. Listen, I'm not saying all that. If you hear bragging about us, you're not hearing about I'm bragging about my God who is able Amen. in very real ways. He's able in practical ways. He's able. He's able to move mountains. They're mountains to you and I. It's a finger flick for him. And he just loves to do that. God wants you to know this morning, whatever you're facing, this is an all grace thing. I've talked about money because you can understand that it's connectable. It's, but it's not just about money. It's about everything. That relationship, you're, you're sure that's broken forever? No, 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 no. God's able. He's able. I've seen him do it. I've seen him do it. He's able. He's able. That person that you're sure they will know, he's able. That need in your life, he's able. And so give into it. Don't give out of your abundance. Give into your need. Because God is able. That's the way it works with him. Would you stand to your feet this morning? If you put the first and last verses we read today together kind of sounds like this. God says, I'm able to do all of it abundantly, always, for you. Now, don't be deceived. I'll not be mocked. Whatever you sow, prove me now in Malachi 3. Prove me now herewith, said God. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour it out, abound, abound. He said, I'm able. So don't be deceived. Don't think that you're so far gone I can't fix you. Don't think because you've been stuck in this rut for 20 years it's a big thing to me. Don't think that person can't change. Don't think the need is so big. Don't be deceived. It's a lie. I'm God and I do whatever I want, he says. I will not be mocked. Whatever you sow, you'll reap. Quick testimony. They were the first people we ever pastored. For more than two months, Gail Beth and I held services Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night to an empty auditorium. It was me and her and an infant child. And one day we had two people show up, Keith and Vickery. Keith and Vicki Avery. 
sat on the second row, left-hand side. Poor people didn't know what they were in for. The look on their face, I will never get it out when it finally came time to start service at 10 o'clock. Had an auditorium not quite as large as this, and I got up front and I said, it's time to start service. And they're looking at me, and they looked at each other, and they looked back, and there's nobody else there. <laughs> Keith and Vicki went on to make things right between them and God. They drove around a little junky, junky little car, a Dodge Dart. They would bungee strap their ladders on top of their car. All their painting supplies went in the trunk. And that's what they did. In that junky little $800 car, they'd drive to a job and they... And one day I preached a message kind of like this. And that hit home with them. And I remember Keith saying to me, we're, we're going to, Pastor, as you probably noticed, we haven't been the givers. You're the only people I got, I promise you. I noticed. Okay? I noticed. You're the only people here. I mean, it's not like, maybe, no, I understand. And they, they'd never done that in their life, and they started to give to God. Then all of a sudden, things just opened up. Next thing you know, they're buying a nice truck, and things opened up, and they're hiring people. They've been doing this for 28, 30 years. And they're, now they're, they're hiring people and they're buying equipment. And they just kept growing and they kept giving. And I think it was three years later. The plate would go by. We're, we got a building. We got, I don't know, 60, 70 people now. Once a month, Keith would write a check for $3,000 to pay the church mortgage. Typical week, he'd throw in another $1,000. A guy who came to church on an $800 car three years later, he's throwing $1,000 a week in the offering plate. And once a month, write a check for $3,274 to make the mortgage payment. And God just kept blessing. I just talked about money again. This is about every area of your life. Come on, people. He wants this for you. I feel in my spirit, and I'm going to close. I feel in my spirit, especially when it comes to finances. Please don't get to the place where you're depending upon the economy to be, to be good, to meet the needs of your family. Amen. Depend on God. God told me years ago, when Gail Beth and I first got married and we were homeless and I'm, I'm looking for my first job and I couldn't get one, he told me this. I told God, I said, I don't, I'm praying because I can't find a job. I can't get anybody to hire me. And I said, God, I can't get a job. I don't know what to do. He said, work for me. I said, okay. I, I know I'm called, but I'm not ready yet. He said, work for me. And in that moment, I understood that wherever I went to work, I wasn't working for them. I was working for him. And when I understood that truth, he said, I always pay well, and I never lay off. <laughs> and so I, I, that settled down into my heart. And, and then he opened the door for the job. You've heard the story. I got hired in pushing the broom. But boy, was I good about pushing that broom. I wasn't working for True Fit Products. I was working for God. It changes everything. It's a joy. Do everything as under the Lord. So man, I was good at pushing my broom. I, I moved stuff. I, you know, I was good at it. I was a capable 24-year-old man, but man, I'm a broom pusher now. And I got advanced. Because I was good at my job even when nobody was looking. Because he was always looking. Is this making sense? And then I, I, I learned from that that you conduct your life in such a way that you understand he's always looking. 
You don't sneak and hide and do something and think you're getting away from it. I'll stop. Because he's always looking. Father, we're thankful. Thankful, God, that your word, though it's a sharp sword, it's two-edged, God. It cuts and it heals. That's a mystery to us, God, but it's what it is. It cuts and it heals. I pray that we be a people that grab a hold of your word today. Holy Spirit, I know you've been speaking to hearts this morning. I pray that every individual here leaves and grabs hold of what you've said to them. Let this be their marching orders, God. Give and it shall be given unto you. Only that which is in circulation do you bless. It's rivers of living water, not rivers of stagnant water. Holy Spirit of God, have your way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, church.